Right. Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Um, I hope you find your first sessions useful and informative, etc. Some great presentations. So we're going to go on to the first keynote speaker and uh, Kevin and I are delighted that Professor Lee Parker, who is currently at the University of Glasgow, is joining us today. Now, uh, I just want to say a few words about Lee. Uh, most of you will have come across Lee's work. I had a wee sneaky poo at his Google citations and nearly fell on the floor because they are over 22,000 and he's got an H index of 74. So these, this is what we all emulate our try, you know, this is where we want to go to, uh, but absolutely brilliant. So Lee, your research areas, I'm sure you might say something about this, are many and varied, including corporate governance, accounting and management history, social environmental accountability, et cetera. Um, you've published widely, I, I lost count of the number of journals that you've published in, uh, but you've published in all of the main accounting journals, including BAR, European Accounting Review, FAM, AOS, Accounting and Finance, Business History, Critical Perspectives, et cetera. Uh, you also have a huge number of prizes, sorry, I hope I'm not embarrassing you, but there's a huge number of prizes, awards and distinctions on your CV, uh, including Hall of Fame uh, for the Australian Centre for Social and Environmental Accounting. You've won a, a countless best paper awards, and you also have an award, an hourglass award for significant contribution to knowledge through research and publishing over a sustained period of time. Uh, you, uh, you have been on numerous editorial boards. I counted 21 journals and I, I stopped counting at that point. Uh, of course, you're the founding editor of AAAJ, so you maybe say something about that as well. And you're also involved in a whole lot of uh, professional and learned societies, uh, etc. Now, more recently, you've been inducted into the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame in 2020 and You've also received some uh, local um, awards, including, for example, the RMIT Dean's Research Excellence Award. Uh, and I wondered, when I read all of that, I wondered, how does this man find any time to do anything uh, other than uh, academic work? But uh, I'm sure you do because you live in uh, beautiful Australia. So over to you, Lee. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much. Um, One fact Joan forgot to mention, oh. and I'm going to uh, declose Lee, is that he's a Methodist. And he has been hiding all of this all this time. But when you look at his autoethnography or ethnography, you find that the driver of his action is his belief. More later. <laughs> This may be true, although I come from the one true faith, uh, my Australian rules football team is Port Adelaide, <laughs> which I would live and die for. Um, you, you've got to be careful about what I say today. I've, I've been, I've flown in after three and a half years out of Britain because we were well locked down in Australia. Um, so I've been here, I don't know, 60 hours or something. So I'm not quite sure where I am. And I'm sorry if any of you were expecting to see me this morning up till now, I was wandering Sheffield, totally lost for an hour. My <laughs> wife brought me here yesterday, so she knew how to get here, but not me. And then I got here and then I didn't know how to, what rooms to go to and it's on Wi-Fi and I've got my Australian mobile and I don't want to turn the data on because it's going to cost me a bucket. I've got my British mobile that I bought two days ago. <laughs> so anything I tell you about how to, you know, get your PhD going, you better think, mm, <laughs> is, this, is this guy to be believed? Uh, God put me on earth to achieve a list of specific tasks. I'm so far behind, I'm never gonna die. <laughs> uh, you got that one, that's good. This life is just a test. If it were a real life, we'd have been given better instructions on where to go and what to do. So that's a start for you. Uh, I think the three key doctoral management ingredients are time, project, and supervisor. You manage those three, all right? The best, most successful PhD candidates I've seen, some I've supervised, others that I've not, 
they manage those. What do I mean by that? In summary, what I mean is time, you've got to manage your personal time versus your work time. And of course, you can see that I don't manage that very well because I've got diarrhea of the pen and I just publish or perish all the time. Uh, you've got to manage your task scheduling, when you're going to do what, by when, and you've got to manage your deadlines. You know, there, there are too many times as PhD students where we've had experience in other lives, other sectors, and we just dump our professional skills because we think now I'm going to have a religious experience. I'm going to do a PhD. Why don't you apply, well, it, even if it's your management accounting lessons you learnt, why don't you pick up some of those and apply them to managing your project and be proactive, not reactive. The worst PhD students I see are the ones who come to the supervisor and go, oh, and what do I do now? What do I do next? Oh, okay, I'll go and do that. You've got to be much more proactive. You know, you're in the end, at the end of a PhD, you're supposed to be an accredited researcher who can identify a problem or issue, design an investigation and go investigate it and write it up. Not a super duper research assistant that once you're told which method to use, which theory, you'll go and do it nicely. There are too many PhD grads in my view nowadays who are really glorified research assistants. You've got to get yourself above that, that sort of level. Um, supervisors, and I know that's why you're all really here. It always gets people in managing the supervisor. Um, you've got to work with them, okay? They're professionals. They may be great. They may be not so great. Doesn't matter, all right? It's no use wandering around saying, oh, I wish I had supervisor X. You know, she's fantastic. I've only got supervisor Y, pretty average performer. Well, think about it. In the workplace, we don't get to choose who we work with. We get hired by an organisation and there'll be some people that are stars and there will be some people that are not very impressive. And you've got to learn to work with them and get a result out of it. So it, it's the same deal. Okay, here are the common causes of delayed PhD or failure to complete. The slow start, don't waste your time. There's too many PhD students I see who nine months in are still reading and choosing a theory and playing around, oh, for goodness sake. You know, if, if I don't have my PhD students starting to collect data in 12 months, something is seriously wrong. Okay, so slow start, not a good idea. Get the pressure on yourself. Treat it like an exam, all right? Just, just treat it like a three hour exam where you think, my God, I'm in the last hour. I'm not in the first hour, I'm in the last hour. Now, if you tell yourself you're in the last hour, you're gonna be better at getting this thing through. Okay, um, perfectionism. I've seen some brilliant PhD students just couldn't let it go. Just couldn't let it go. No, no, it's not ready yet. Oh, I can't give you that draft yet because I'm not, it's not up to my standards. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> All right, near enough's good enough. I have the same attitude to my own research and some of my good colleagues here will start nodding going, yeah, he does. <laughs> uh, where I say, well, I've worked, I've worked my butt off on this paper and I know it could be better, but damn it, I think I'll conference it, I'll seminar it, and then I'll give it a go at a journal. The reviewers are going to beat me up anyway, because they've always got to prove to the editor that they know things, you know, and they've got improvements to suggest. So I'm going to get made to do revisions anyway. So near enough can be sort of good enough. You'll treat your supervisors like I treat the reviewers. They're going to tell you how to improve stuff, and as long as you give them some, some good stuff in draft in the first instance, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Lack of focus is a problem. You know, you, you can really get into your project and then find some interesting side issues. Oh, goody. And it's like, it's like running off into a corner and looking at this interesting side issue. Well, go and file it for future reference. But don't end up like a colleague of mine, Neil Lewis, who, lovely guy. I was supervising his PhD, mature age PhD student, brilliant. Had fantastic data, a great mind but he kept going off in sidelines. And I remember, he was taller than me once, saying to him, Neil, where, where is the, you know, where's some drafts for me to look at? We've been two years now. And I remember he said to me, oh, look, don't worry, it, they'll be soon. It's all in my head. I can tell you the whole story now. <laughs> so I remember wandering around him, looking up at him like this. <laughs> and I said, well, that's great, but I can't see it. Unless you give me something in writing, I can't help you improve it. 
he never finished. Very sad, he never finished. So data collection delays and problems. Be practical, be realistic. Don't go down that track that we're all taught in research methods. You know, what is the issue you're trying to investigate, right? Therefore, this is the appropriate theory and you need this method, but it mightn't work. I mean, you mightn't be able to get the data. So you try and modify the objective of the study and the method and the data so they all match. In other words, can I get the data? You know, is this practicable? I don't think I can. Hmm. Okay. What data can I get? I could get this. Hmm. Should I maybe tweak my study objective so it matches the data I can get? It's called reverse engineering. And believe me, in some of those articles of mine that have put some of you to sleep, that's exactly what I've done in some of my projects. You know, okay, I can get this sort of data so I can answer that sort of question. Well, why not do that? So be very practical about, if you start running into delays collecting data, then of course, talk to your supervisors about how to manage it, but think about what can you do while you're waiting to get the data? Can you draft other stuff? You know, you can be drafting literature reviews, theory chapters, you know, the stuff you can be drafting while you're waiting for certain interviews or trying to get surveys to come in. Or if they're not coming in, then you might have to get some other sorts of data, all right, and tweak the question. Um, poor project management and poor self-discipline. In other words, manage yourself. Do you know, in the UK, the latest stats I can get on PhD completions say that approximately 80% of British university PhD candidates do complete. So that's encouraging, isn't it? Feeling happy now? Yeah. But the average candidate just stretches between 3.5 and four years. In other words, there's a big rump of people who complete, but they don't do it in the three year run. Maybe you're having a wonderful time and uh, you, know, you wanna spread it out. Okay, <laughs> success prerequisites. Figure out why you're doing this. You don't have to tell anybody, but really, really figure it out. Is it because you think you're gonna get job X? Okay. Is it because you wanna be called Dr. Doctor? Okay. You know, it doesn't really matter what the rationale is, but figure out why in the hell are you putting yourself through this thing? All right, because as you probably already know, it is a darn lot of work and you're giving up an awful lot to do it. So, have a reason for yourself that you can remind yourself. Be excited about your project at the start. If you are like, you know, well, it's all right. The supervisors gave it to me. This is what I'm doing. You're, you may not finish, all right? Because even when you're excited at the start, I can guarantee you mostly that by the time you finish, you'll probably never want to hear that topic again, or at least want a break of a year or two because you're very tired of it, okay? So you really need to get yourself wound up and excited at the start. Persistence, hard work, and attention to detail. There is no substitute for these things. And the loneliness of the long distance runner. I don't care who tells you that they love you so much. I don't care who, what group you're in, they're all mutually supportive. It is a lonely job. You are the long distance runner out there in the snow and the rain and the sleet jogging along with an occasional person running up beside you, encouraging you saying, great stuff, you know, keep going. And then off you go on your own again. So, you know, you are alone, but when things go wrong, and they always do in PhDs, remember everybody's been there. I mean, I haven't met anybody that's done a PhD that's had a completely smooth sail, wonderful, happy sort of children's storybook experience. So when things go a bit pear-shaped, just remember, even though you feel like you're the only person in the world this has happened to, you're not, that it, it's happened to pretty much everybody. Uh, remember, there are risks, there are distractions. I mean, things are gonna go wrong. There'll be personal things, life changes. You know, you can never predict it. But just remember that there will be things, I mean, it's life. If you're gonna do three or four years on this, uh, there are gonna be ch changes in your circumstances, personal circumstances, whatever, that are gonna be challenges that you're gonna to have to try and manage. And you may need other people to help you manage those or whatever, but it's better to expect the unexpected, to say, well, I knew things could happen and 
gee whiz, they have. Now, how am I going to manage that? The, re the winning recipes are structure, deadlines, oh, in other words, be My wife and I went to the same class of school from the age of five to university. Um, uh, I don't think I ever got above. I've seen a lot of people like me, but who were highly organised as PhD candidates, and they succeeded wonderfully well. You don't have to be Einstein to produce a top PhD. Um, and you just don't give up. I, I'm reminded of a colleague of mine who used to be a CEO of a nonprofit organisation where he got in uh, experts, you know, legal, marketing, all that sort of stuff, accounting, onto some of his advisory boards. And he used to despair because he'd say to me, I don't know what's wrong with these people. You know, they seem to think that this is a different world they're coming into. So as they come into the meeting room, they carefully take their brains out and put them just by the door. And then they march in with a completely empty brain. And I think, going back to my point about, you know, draw on your own expertise that you've already got in terms of being organised and managing this process. Um, there's the supervisor roles. Little shopping list. You're big people. You can read it. We're getting 30 seconds quiet reading time. <coughs> Note my last point. Um, the, the supervisor is not there to develop the topic and write the thesis for you. I get, no joke, about um, probably four PhD inquiries per week to me globally. I would love to do a PhD with you. Right. The worst ones are the ones that say, oh, you know, you, you're just such a Top, top publisher in social environmental accounting. And I'm really interested in that area. And I'll, I'll do anything you'd like me to do. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> okay, I'm not there to develop the, you know, give the, here's, oh, here's a topic for you. In science, yeah, they do it. In, in social sciences, we don't. So, you know, you've really got to show some initiative. Look, it's okay to present what you think would be a good project, you've done a little mini design to your supervisors and then to say, eh, well, okay, that's a start, but we change this and we change that, that's fine. You know, you've given them something to work with and they start to think, oh, this person's actually got initiative. You know, they're actually thinking for themselves. They're thinking like a PhD student. So that's, you know, that's absolutely fine. Um, Huh. Supervisory style. What, what you hope for is good chemistry and good communication um, with supervisor and supervisee. Uh, you're hoping that the supervisor will have empathy. They, will, they can put themselves in the place of the candidate. They can understand where you're coming from, what you're grappling with. But you really want tough supervisors. You know, you really do want them to beat you up a bit. Because if they don't beat you up, the examiners sure as heck are going to beat you up. All right, so um, it's better to have tough supervision, you know, red marks all over your drafts, where you go off and have a little cry and then start trying to work out how to deal with all these red marks on your drafts. Um, you know, I, I often say, look, it's a great idea to go and buy a teddy or a doll and give it your supervisor's name and have a few hat pins around. You know, <laughs> you know the odd evening thing. You know. <laughs> it's good therapy. They won't know. It's all right. Okay. That's all good. I remember a great colleague of mine who's retired from academia now called Nick Mangos. And he had, as a supervisor, another great colleague of mine who was an international management professor called uh, Professor Peter O'Brien. And Pete was tough. And Nick used to come to me regularly going, you know, Pete's a terrible supervisor. You know, he tells me my stuff's rubbish. He's giving me a terrible time. And I go, there, 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 there. The day his PhD went through without a single adjustment, I can remember Nick coming down the corridor to me and saying, I don't care what they say about O'Brien. He's a top supervisor. <laughs> top supervisor. 
Now, you know, you're all accountants and finance people, so you should understand, you know, in today's world, a bit sad, including universities, all driven by output. You know, stuff the process, stuff the people, it's all about output. The KPIs, well, there's an example. You know, if your supervisor beats you up, but you end up with a really top product that the examiners go, great stuff, have a nice viva, all through, I think then you'll look back at the supervisor and you'll put your teddy away and you put the hat pins away and say, <laughs> love them, they were great. Let me summarize it. I, see, I, sometimes I think little stories like I'm trying to tell stick in your head more than a list of to-dos. What about the story of the, uh, the rabbit that was doing a PhD? The rabbit's sitting outside its burrow and it's reading a draft of one of the chapters. Nice sunny day, not like today. And uh, suddenly out of the bushes jumps a weasel. And the weasel goes, rabbit, lunch, terrific. And the rabbit says, just a minute, sorry, I'm not that sort of rabbit. You see, I'm doing a PhD, I'm a different sort of rabbit. The weasel said, what difference does that make? So tell you what, go down the burrow and you'll see my first draft down there. You have a look and then you'll understand. So the weasel said, okay, I'll be back. I shot down, rabbit went on, reading away. Next minute, out of the bushes jumps a fox. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's the, that's the weasel down the burrow. Is it one of our online people? Everybody mute on Zoom, please. <laughs> this is a good presentation skills point. I also do a seminar on presentation skills for PhD students. And now, how are you going to get the audience's attention back? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So anyway, the fox goes through the same routine, blah, blah, blah. You know, no, I'm not that sort of rabbit. Go down the burrow, you'll see. So the fox went down. Rabbit finished going through this particular draft chapter and thought, well, I'm a bit hungry myself. Where's the weasel? Where's the fox? Went down the burrow. And as the rabbit's eyes became accustomed to the dark, he realized there was just paper everywhere. I mean, what the heck have they been doing? You know, I told him to come down and read it, not throw it all around. And then there was a little glint in the corner of the burrow. And the rabbit looked across, and there was a pile of weasel bones all over the place. Oh, what's been going on here? Over the other side, another glint, and saw a pile of fox bones neatly stacked. And the rabbit thought, I, I don't know what's happened here. And at that moment, there was movement at the back of the burrow. And the rabbit peered through the gloom, and there was this bloody great lion. And the rabbit thought to itself, you know, it's true what they say. It's not what's in your PhD that counts. It's who your supervisor is. <laughs> <laughs> you remember nothing else. That'll be a good one. <laughs> okay, so... Um, joint supervisor advantages. Uh -oh. This is now not working. Um, because most of the time now you have more than one supervisor. Doesn't it's not crucial if you don't. And these are the sort of benefits that I'm putting up in front of you. Um, they might be formal. Some of them might be informal. For instance, I did my Master of Philosophy PhD, or my Master of Philosophy, which is my major thesis, started at Glasgow Uni and then switched to Dundee University because I was going broke, so I needed a better job at Dundee. And I had a combination of formal supervisors. And fortunately, my formal supervisors also realised there were a couple of people that had really good expertise that were linked to me and they were prepared to assist. So, you know, you, you can use a range of people. Um, or sometimes you need a, a mentor. Uh, so when I did my PhD at Monash University in Melbourne, um, I had, one day I had a guy who was lecturing with me, who was a consultant. He didn't believe in research at all. But he stopped me in a corridor and he said, how's that PhD going? 
And I was only the second PhD, I'm so old, second PhD in Monash ever in accounting. And I said, oh, well, you know, so I'm getting along. He said, coffee, 3 p.m. So he met me for coffee and then he, he quizzed me on how it was going and what I'm going to do next. And, and then said, we'll do coffee in another four weeks. Uh, and he stayed with me through the project. I never quite understood why he did. He probably felt sorry for me. And then there was another colleague who also um, felt concerned for me. Uh, and he was sort of like my father figure. So when things went wrong, he would come and patch me up and say, there, there, you're going to be okay, you'll get there. And I remember one of my supervisors didn't know about this. And I put these guys in my acknowledgement. And my supervisor came in because he'd seen the draft acknowledgement and said, what is Lewis and what is uh, uh, Urquhart doing in there? I said, because without them, I wouldn't have finished the PhD. I don't think he was hugely impressed, but I was, I was. Um, possible problems with uh, joint supervision uh, are sometimes they can get conflicting, you can get conflicting advice. And that's when you need to just talk to them and say, well, look, uh, I've had that happen to me as a PhD student myself, where I said, well, look guys, you know, you've told me this and you've told me that, I'll, I'll just, can you talk to each other? I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And I sorted it just by just I mean, being, you know, sort of professional and respectful, just by communicating. Um, but sometimes you really need to have at least one person that's got an overall view of the project. You, usually they do. And it's also nice to know who's the lead supervisor. Usually formally, there is a lead supervisor and you need to know that. It's just important to know that, okay. Supervisors should expect this shopping list out of you. Oops, going right again. Sorry, all over the place. You should expect these things out of your supervisor. Now, be careful about the relevant knowledge bit, because often in a supervisory team, there's one person that does know the topic area you're in. There's another one who might not be hot on that, but's very good at the method and or the theory you're in. So, I mean, it's a team thing, okay? And just remember, if you get to a point where you feel like you've gone past your supervisor's knowledge of the topic, that's actually a good thing, isn't it? Because normally PhD reports from examiners the examiner has to tick a box. Is this an original contribution of knowledge? Tick, yes. So you should expect that you would end up getting past what was already known in the literature by your supervisors. So you develop your topic ideas and structure. You should seek advice regularly. Now, supervisors are busy people. They're chasing their own KPIs. So they're sitting in their monk's cell trying to crunch out publications and do their admin and go to meetings and all the rest of it. So you should take responsibility for, you know, email, text, whatever, communicating regularly. Even if you just say, look, uh, just thought you'd like to know I'm working on this. This is going that way. It can be quick, easy to read. The best candidates I like are the ones where if somebody says to me, how is uh, how's Suchi App going? And I can say, well, actually, uh, this is where Sue Chat's at. Because they've been sending me some emails. We may not have had a meeting for a month, but that's okay. I know what they're doing. The worst moment is where they haven't been communicating. We haven't met for a month, and I don't know what they're doing. Then I feel a little foolish as a supervisor. So, uh, you know, you've got to win their confidence and support. My wife talks about me with my gritted teeth smile. You know, when things aren't going so well, but I think I've got to look enthusiastic and, you know, nice and all the rest of it. So I have my gritted teeth smile on. Yeah, everything's great. Yeah, really enjoying myself. Uh, that's what you need to do. Every meeting you go into, unless you've got a personal problem or something's imploded on you, then you should sit in front of your supervisors. I mean, you know, within <coughs> confidentiality limits, of course, and say, look, you know, I've got to tell you honestly where I'm at. You know, I've got a problem because they might be able to help or they can refer you to someone. It's no use hiding the bad stuff. 
But on the other hand, generally speaking, even if you're not feeling, you don't have to feel enthusiastic about your PhD every day, but when you meet the supervisors, whether it be online or whether it be in person, project a bit of enthusiasm and organisation because they get lots of people who don't. So I don't care what anybody says, supervisors, they get assessed, not just on their own KPIs and publications, but on your success. You crack a good PhD, they're loving it. Tick, they've got another score on the board. So I like backing winning horses. I like backing winning horses in the horse race. How do I pick winning horses? I pick the, the PhD candidates who are highly organized, got some energy, got some enthusiasm, you know, meet with me regularly, tell me what they're gonna do, ask me for advice. And I think, uh, I think you might be across the line earlier than some of the others. That's gonna be good for you and it's gonna be good for me. So there's a bit of self-interest in that. Um, so take responsibility for keeping your supervisors informed, even if they don't ask to be. So there you are, there's some of my things about keeping supervisor support. I suppose I would summarize what I'm telling you by what I used to say to some of my strategic management classes. I, I've been a very strange animal. I've morphed between accounting and also management, strategic management, corporate governance as an educator. And uh, I've also done a lot of strategic management consultancy. And I remember saying to some of my strategic management classes, hey, you know, you expect professional delivery from me. You're going to get it. I, in return, expect professional performance from you, which is a nice bit of double loop learning because usually I was teaching strategy at the back end of their degree. So you're about to go out there in the big wide world where it's at the sharp end of the stick and you've got to perform professionally on deadline under pressure. I think, I think that's exactly the philosophy that if you use, you will keep supervisor support. So set your own milestones. You know, you all heard that phrase, you know, I, uh, I love deadlines, especially the whooshing sound they make as they go past. Some of you have heard it, some of you haven't. Neve Brennan's here and she's gonna remember exactly this little story I'm about to tell. She had me quite a lot of years ago uh, visit her at University College Dublin. And she said, listen, we've got a master's class that are about to do their summer dissertations. Would you go and speak to them? So it's sort of a room like this. Neve may not remember, but I remember it well. So there they all were. So I started talking about some of these things, about getting that summer project done, managing it. And one of the things I said to them was, you need to set up your own milestones. I'm going to get this job done by then, that by then, that by then. And you'll probably fall behind on some of them. You know, that, that's okay. But if you don't set up milestones, then when somebody says to you, I'll use your language, how's the PhD going? You're likely in, in sort of complete self-deception to say, yeah, no, it's going pretty well. Yeah, yeah, it's going okay. And it's not at all. <laughs> so if you set up milestones, and I said to this class, listen, it's I know it's I know it's an electronic world. But if you've got a spot where you're always working, why don't you print the deadlines or hand write them up and stick them on a wall or a filing cabinet right in front of you so they're staring at you every day. And you can see one coming at you and you think, God, you know, I don't think I'm going to make that deadline. That's all right. You know, you can amend it, give yourself another week, but then you know you're one week behind. And I said to that class, well, we're in Ireland, aren't we? I mean, you should understand what I'm talking about here. I mean, you know, Roman Catholic guilt. What I'm telling you is I give you permission to set up milestones and then when, as inevitably you will, you miss some of them, you can give yourself a darn good thrashing. I am a weak, you know, inadequate, ill-performing person. Get on with it. I'm quite serious about this. I, I still set deadlines like this sometimes for myself on, on particular projects. And then I really hammer myself to try and get through them. And, and that's why I, some, I get sometimes a mood to and say, how do you get everything you done that you get done? Because sometimes I treat a project like an exam. You know, this is going to start then and this has got to be done by then. It mightn't be the world's greatest thing, but at least I'll have it and then I can do some further work with it. So it's better to have a plan than no plan at all. That would be, that would be my point. 
Um, communication. Um, there's a bit of some of some of the details. It's all very all to say to communicate, but that's that's some of the detail, the sort of things that that I think the best PhD students I see, the highly organised ones. That's that's the stuff they do. Like send your drafts well in advance. Your supervisors have got a million things to do. They just can't instantly read things overnight. Give them drafts well in advance. Be honest with them about your own progress, the problems you've got, because sometimes they know some simple tricks that will help you, all right? So it's okay to tell them how you're feeling. Uh, last point, dealing with vague responses. Sometimes a supervisor with the best of intentions will tell you what's wrong or what you need to do, and you'll think, I don't understand. I didn't understand that at all. Don't just walk away not understanding, okay? Uh, I, I think of a, uh, a terrific Greek colleague of mine in Melbourne I had who one day was in my office crying because he'd been through this with a professor who was a nice guy, actually, but he, he, he walked away and he didn't know what to do. And I said to him, you've got to go back. He, he's not going to eat you, you know, it, go back. Uh, and I had the same person who supervised me, who was a good supervisor, who did the same thing. There was one day he said, look, I've read these draft chapters, but know, they're just not hanging together. Like, you know, I just can't sort of see the link. And I'm sitting there thinking, what? what's that about? What am I supposed to do? So do you know what I did? I got up out of my chair and I went round behind his desk with him and said, oh, okay, Graham, could you just give me one example? I went, oh, okay. So he showed me one example and I got it straight away. I got what didn't link. And then I could go and check all the other backs and fronts of chapters. So, you know, don't, don't be afraid to ask something about it. Um, Oh, thank you. I couldn't see that. <laughs> uh, hang on, it's very faint. Oh, sorry, Two minutes. Okay. So, That's your dead uh, <laughs> I had a great PhD candidate who's a lecturer at University of Adelaide uh, called Masum Mahmoud, who would come into meetings with me. This would be a story that will summarise that, where he would have a list of points he wanted to explain to me about what he'd done. He would have a list of questions he wanted me to answer and he would run it like an agenda. And I loved it because such an organised PhD student, I'd just sit there and go, oh, okay. So he tells me what he's done. Then he asks me the questions. I answer those. And then he says, have you got any questions? And then we do, do we talk about the next thing we do? That's, that's what I call brilliant. And he completed on time really well. In summary, there's a whole bunch of risks and challenges. Basically, Talk to your supervisors, manage your project properly, keep communicating with your supervisors, build that relationship, even if they're, you know, they're not heavily into relationships. And as soon as you get any problems, nail them as soon as practicable. Uh, I will conclude like this. Roosevelt said, believe you can and you're halfway there. Mandela said, I never lose. I either win or I learn. I will now finish running 30 seconds over time with a small story for you. This is a story about, some of you will have heard, it might not be your religion, but Noah and the ark. When there was going to be the flood and Noah put all the animals two by two in the ark, right? Okay, here we go. The Lord said to Noah, where is the ark I commanded you to build? And Noah said, verily, I have three carpenters off sick probably with COVID. The gopher wood supply has let me down. And even that's even though the gopher wood's been on order for nigh on 12 months. And God said to Noah, I want that ark finished in seven days and seven nights. And Noah said, oh, it, it will be so. And it was not so. And the Lord said to Noah, what seems to be the trouble this time? And Noah said, well, my subcontract has gone bankrupt. The pitch for the outside of the ark has not arrived and the glazier has gone on holidays, even though I offered to pay him double time. Shem's formed a pop group with his brothers Ham and Japheth and Lord, I am undone. And the Lord grew angry and said, all right, what about the animals? Two of every sort. Where, for example, are the giraffes? And Noah said, they've been delivered to the wrong address and they should be here on Friday. 
And the Lord said, well, where are the monkeys? And the elephants and the zebras. And Noah said, well, they're expected today. And the Lord said, well, what about the unicorns? Well, you know, at this Noah wrung his hands and he wept and he said, Lord, they're a discontinued line. You know, you cannot get unicorns for love or money. You know how it is. And the Lord said, Noah, my son, I know. Why else do you think I'm sending the flood? So I say to you, don't drown in the flood. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for questions, so uh, can you just, uh, I don't know if we have a microphone, I don't think we have, have we, Stuart? Oh, there is. No, no. All right, okay, so uh, can we have some questions? As, as the Scottish comedian Billy Colley would say, shocked and stunned and not a little amazed. <laughs> <laughs> Any any questions? Anybody at all? Dorothy Dick's questions are okay. If you know what they are. Rich, Otherwise, you get out early. Which is Rich should always ask the first question. <laughs> so it's more of an observationally, actually. I mean, everything I agree with almost. I think everything you said actually. <clears throat> Two points just to reinforce. One, when I've been a PhD examiner. And it's not very good. The reason is the supervisor did not give the right advice. Uh, it's very rarely the candidate's fault. I mean, they may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but you know, they could produce a workable, but they haven't been guided properly. They haven't. I think the, the fact that universities <laughs> usually now require two supervisors has dealt with some of the problems. But if you have one and it's bad, you're basically. Um, okay, this point about supervisors. I mean, as examiners, we can only really suspect whether the problems with a, a thesis for examining could have been better handled by supervision. That, that is true. If you are the candidate and you're a bit concerned about supervisory quality, there are two options you can use. One, which I know some of you maybe culturally will think, oh, I wouldn't do that, but you can go to postgraduate research coordinator. There will be an academic who oversees all of the PhD program supervisors and staff. They will maintain confidentiality. I've been one of those. I've had people come to me with this sort of issue. Okay, it can be handled and it can be handled sometimes in ways that are not offensive to the existing supervisors. There may be a supervisory change or whatever, but just remember, you know, usually in your university regulations, there is facility for you to talk to the high degree, high research degree program coordinator in confidence. That's one thing. Second thing is, uh, I go back to the point about if you think that maybe you could get some more advice, some, you know, additional advice, keep your eyes and ears open for people you may be able to talk to. Uh, I'll give you a personal example. Uh, I started my master's thesis at Glasgow University. I was given a supervisor who was a super guy. He was an ex-public servant. And I went to my first meeting with him and he said, look, you know, terrific, happy to help you. Uh, I really don't know anything about your topic at all, old chap. He said, but, uh, you know, anything I can do, feel free to call on me. And I walked out in the corridor and I thought, oh, I won't tell you what I thought. And I thought, oh, I a problem. Now, um, we've had a reference, true. I used to go to the Central Methodist Church in the middle of the city. It's now where the concert hall at Glasgow University is. And it was, a, it was built in circular style because that was what John Wesley used to like in those days. And there used to be this woman who brought along her husband. Well, I thought it was really nice because he used to sit there in the services with his mouth open. Sort of like, mm. I thought, isn't it lovely that she brings him along? Anyway, one day in the university staff club, he walked past me and I said to my colleague, who's that? I said, oh, I think he's, I think he's sociology, Eldridge. So I looked him up. He was professor of sociology. Oh, my goodness. 
Next Sunday, I'm there. She brings him in, and I'm very green, very naive, okay? I think I was 24 years of age, something like that. At the end of the service, I raced across, introduced myself, and said, you know, I'm, I'm doing behavioural budgeting stuff you know, in my master's thesis. Do you know anything about that? Turned out he was the best published industrial sociology professor in Britain at the time. He was so nice to me. He became, without my department knowing, my informal supervisor. I used to go to his house. He used to give me reading to do. And, and, and in fact, we've been lifetime colleagues. I, I lost him uh, in the last six months, uh, which greatly saddens me. But this was one of those cases where I just kept my antenna up and then look, what, what do you got to lose? So I've often had, and I've encouraged my own PhD students, if they find someone who's got particular expertise or additional stuff that I don't have, use them, talk to them, bring it into the thesis. So there's two ways, they won't always solve it all, but there's two ways of trying to manage that. Yeah, um, it's probably quite a basic question, but from the perspective of supervisor, how much is too much in terms of communication? Because I think I had my annual review recently and the uh, supervisor was like, I'm so proud of what you've done based on how independent you've been, which I never really thought the fact that, oh, I'm not actually maybe keeping them that updated. And I'm just wondering sort of, well, I mean, because sometimes even if, even if it's just to say, oh, I'm still working on this, it's a, it's a sort of, yeah. you know, how often okay. do you expect to I, I, I give two, two comments on that. You know, supervisor says, I'm proud of you. You've been so independent. But I mean, it, it, the meaning might be several meanings, okay? The meaning might be that you've shown a lot of independence and initiative in pursuing your project. I suspect that's really it. If it's like, oh, well, I didn't really know you were doing all this. Well, that's okay because they're clearly happy. So that's fine. Uh, how much communication is too much? Uh, you know, I mean, I think... You know, probably, I mean, there's no magic trick, is there? And supervisors all differ as individuals. But, you know, I'd say at least communicating once a month. Uh, I mean, I, I sometimes meet with candidates or have met with candidates where I don't want to meet with them for three months because they're just collecting data. And we can just have a phone call or a text. or You know, they don't need it. And then there'll be other periods where it's very intensive and we're meeting more than, you know, we're meeting weekly for several several months. So it's just something you ex you experiment with it, all right? You you try, you know, that odd regular email, uh, seek the odd meeting, see how they're reacting. Usually, I think, when they see you showing initiative and managing things, they'll usually react pretty positively. Um, so, yeah, you just up the communications a bit, see how they react. Even if they just send a, okay, thanks, that's fine. That's fine, because it means they know what you're doing. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Uh, that was fascinating. And obviously, you are a very wise young man uh, <laughs> with a beard, maybe borrowed beard, you know. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to uh, raise, I guess, uh, uh, the question around diversity and gender. So, for example, you know, and we have already seen, I mean, the presentations have been, and in BAFA as well. We're getting a vast diversity of students doing PhDs from yeah. all over the world, yeah. and it's been growing over the years. Now, one of the things that happens, of course, is this is the motherland of the English language. Uh, this is like, uh, you know, everyone has a little accent, but the English speak English perfectly, you know, without any accent. And uh, so there's that kind of nervousness about the accent. You know, they may know a lot but they, they feel that because they can't pronounce it properly, uh, that, uh, you know, that they're, and then there's the gender issue about, uh, what do we call it? Uh, uh, what's the psychological thing where the women feel that they are- Imposter. Uh, sorry, imposter, imposter syndrome, imposter. So, how, so PhD supervisors need uh, a bit of training around those issues. Uh, and I really feel a PhD at many levels, and you kind of pointed out, is a constant attack on your confidence. Because at the end of the day, the supervisor is never happy, but at the end of the day, it's all right, time for your exam, right? That's that's about it. But that's the same thing happens afterwards when you apply, when you do research articles and send them to people like Lee Parker. Not good, not good, not good. All right, pass it, we'll let you go, right? So, so we got that constant process. Now, what do we do? in terms of, so when the student first comes, they come with motivation, they come with confidence. 
They come with enthusiasm. I was there once, right? They come with all of that. But the supervisors often are very insensitive to that diversity, to that gender. And those first few three to six months can make such a huge difference, not just by the supervisor, but also in, the, in terms of the way the welcome is organized by the rest of the department, the confidence. And, you know, all the theorists are white, I'm sorry, in the social sciences, you know, and, and that is another level of prejudice, which also comes through, right? So, that was a good question. Right? Right, 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 right. Uh, <laughs> question. This lady wants to ask a question, maybe related to that, just quickly, because we we have to go. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much for the insightful uh, uh, I have a question regarding supervision. So, uh, I'm in my second year PhD, and I've changed to like four supervisors. Each supervisor comes like wanting to take the the research a particular direction and it's very daunting for me as a student so what advice can you give a student in this situation yeah I, look i think uh if you have supervisory changes where different supervisors want to take the research in different directions i think that's where you need to actually go and sit down confidentially with the higher degree research coordinator and just you know you, you don't have to say you, you can handle it this way you can say to them i'm not here to criticize anybody but I'd like you with me to review that I've had these changes and then each time there's been a directional change, I need to get certainty and stability. So I think that's, that's where you need a senior academic in the administrative role who oversees all the supervisors and the students to sit and look at your case and then either make sure that the supervisor you've now got is it and it stays that way or manages it somehow because it's very that's a very difficult thing to manage when you've gone through changes like that so you know i don't always say that sort of thing but that's where i think you know you can just say look i'm doing my best and i've had these changes and they'll be aware of it or they should be uh, when they look at your record and then you just get some good advice on how to you know like what's going to happen with your supervision will it now stabilize uh yeah that's that's really what i do Okay, I'm sure there's plenty of other questions. Maybe we can have some discussion over lunch or coffee, etc. Just back to your point, because we didn't answer, and the universities really should be taking care of the quality and diversity and actually have an adequate training for the supervisory staff. And I know some are doing that, but maybe some are a bit behind. So I think that's part of the university's problem to be resolved, to be fixed. But anyway, that's a big problem. Okay, so I think we better go. So can we thank Lee again, please? And we'll move on. Sorry, I didn't ask you a question before. I'm going to run out of time. <laughs>